Have you ever fantasized about the thrill of visiting outer space? Well, get ready for a tale that turns that dream into a cosmic horror show. We're not talking your run-of-the-mill space adventures here. We're diving into the peculiar story of an astronaut who went from living the dream to floating through the nightmare of deep space for a whopping 311 days. This is not your average spacewalk, friends. We'll navigate through the collapse of nations, dance around the edges of time travel, and unravel the astonishing account of a spaceman's odyssey. That makes Lost in Space sound like a charming vacation brochure. Hold on to your helmets because this is one wild ride through the cosmos that you won't believe actually happened. But hey, let's not keep all this fascinating knowledge to ourselves. Join our community of curious minds by subscribing right away. When you do, drop us a comment saying, I subscribe to let us know you're on board. We'll be thrilled to respond and engage with your questions and suggestions. Together, let's embark on an exciting journey to uncover hidden secrets and untold tales on Becker's casual history. Our story unfolds in the Soviet Union, precisely in Russia, where Sergei Krikalev entered the world on August 27, 1958, in the city once called Leningrad, now known as St. Petersburg. Growing up in the midst of the intense space race between the Soviet Union and the USA, Sergei was keenly aware of the competitive technological showcases that defined this mid-20th century Cold War era. The space race, an outgrowth of this geopolitical tension, witnessed both superpowers striving to assert dominance in spaceflight. Undeterred by the geopolitical stakes, Sergei kept his gaze fixed on the stars, eventually earning a degree in mechanical engineering in 1981 from the Leningrad Mechanical Institute. Post-graduation, Sergei secured employment with NPO Energia, the Russian industrial organization responsible for manned spaceflight activities within the Soviet space program. In his initial years, he contributed to the testing of spaceflight equipment and played a pivotal role in ground control for space missions. Sergei's career reached a turning point during the in-orbit rescue mission of the Salyut 7 space station in 1985. Following the station's failure, he played a key role in remotely guiding repairs to the station's onboard control system. Bolstered by these successes, Sergei was chosen for cosmonaut training, an intensive course covering various aspects of space-related knowledge, including astronomy, orbital mechanics, and scientific experimentation methods. Completing this rigorous training, Sergei earned his cosmonaut wings in 1986. In early 1988, Sergei commenced training for his inaugural long-duration spaceflight aboard the Mir space station, then the largest artificial satellite in orbit. Launched on February 20, 1986, Mir's primary goal was to explore the effects of space travel on the human body and engage in observational sciences, including Earth's surface studies. On November 26, 1988, Sergei finally embarked on his journey to Mir as part of the Soyuz 7 expedition. The expedition concluded 151 days later. Having experienced a relatively smooth operation, Sergei found himself eager to return to space, yearning for the vastness beyond. But here's where it gets spicy. With one space mission in the bag, Sergei was itching for more, craving the vastness of the cosmos like a kid yearning for candy. Little did he know his next journey wouldn't just take him to infinity and beyond, it would leave him pining to get back to Earth. Do you ever wonder what life on Mirs was like? Well, Sergei sure had a first-hand experience. By December 1990, he was gearing up for round two of his cosmic adventures getting prepped for the Soyuz 12 mission. On May 18, 1991, Sergei, accompanied by Anatoly Artsebarksy, a seasoned Ukrainian commander, and Helen Sharman, the first British astronaut, arrived at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. This cosmodrome, located in what is now Kazakhstan, earned fame as the world's inaugural spaceport for launching rockets into space. The Baikonur Cosmodrome had witnessed remarkable milestones in space exploration, serving as the launch site for the first artificial Earth satellite Sputnik on October 4, 1957. Additionally, it marked the spot where Yuri Gagarin became the first human to journey into space. Though Sergei anticipated a relatively routine mission, unbeknownst to him, in 311 days, 
he would find himself listed among Baikonur's most historic travelers. If Sergei had a penchant for spotting omens, he might have sensed early on that this trip wouldn't be a cakewalk. As their spacecraft approached Mir after a two-day trek, the targeting system threw a tantrum, forcing Sergei to manually dock their rocket. Now, in the world of space travel, that's like threading a needle with a sledgehammer. You see, space stations like Mir usually rely on an automatic docking system to avoid cosmic fender benders. Doing it manually? Well, that's a high-stakes game and one wrong move could spell disaster. But fear not, because Sergei, ever the cool-headed space maestro, pulled off the maneuver flawlessly. Now, Mir wasn't exactly the Ritz-Carlton. Mir had the capacity for up to six people, but typically, only three cosmonauts lived there concurrently due to the cramped space. The station experienced 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets daily, prompting residents to cover portholes during sleep to create darkness and simulate nighttime. So, let me walk you through a day in the life of these cosmonauts up there on Mir. They'd rise and shine at 8 in the morning, Moscow time kicking off the day with some serious cosmic productivity featuring scientific experiments and station maintenance. By 1 p.m., it was come home time for lunch and a workout. Now, don't think these workouts were just for show. In space, maintaining muscle mass is like a daily survival checklist. Thanks to the low gravity, Astronauts could experience up to a whopping 20% muscle loss on these space flights, even if it was just a quick 5-11 to 11 day jaunt. After a nutritious lunch and that all-important workout session, they'd clock in another 3 hours of work plus another hour of exercise. The day then wrapped up with dinner and some evening downtime where most of them couldn't resist gazing out of the portholes marveling at the beauty of our blue marble, Earth. Now, while being in space had its enchantments, Mir wasn't exactly a five-star resort. Imagine the Millennium Falcon, but in real life. A masterpiece of modern engineering, sure, but also a bit of a piece of trash. Constant technical malfunctions plagued Mir, and by Sergei's second visit, it was practically a disco with its lights flickering off randomly. This wasn't just frustrating. It was a constant reminder of how much they relied on this wonky tech just to breathe and stay pressurized, essentially to survive. Every flicker must have felt like a mini heart attack. And as if that wasn't enough, these technical hiccups turned Mir into a breeding ground for microorganisms. So, the station had a distinct aroma, a delightful blend of mold and space pilot B.O. Come May 26, 1991, Helen and the two other cosmonauts finished their missions and jetted back to Earth, leaving Sergei and Anatoly with their own cosmic mission by playing handyman and keeping Mir in tip-top shape. In a tale that's a bit like a space-themed thriller mixed with a Houston, we got a problem moment. Sergei's mission on Mir was a roller coaster with twists that even Hollywood would find hard to script. Originally set to wrap up in October 1991, Sergei had a solid five months left on Mir, and the to-do list was packed. The crown jewels of the agenda? Six spacewalks planned by Sergei and Anatoly, each a high-stakes venture to conduct crucial repairs and upgrades on the space station's exterior. In the final spacewalk, Anatoly's helmet visor fogged up because his spacesuit's heat exchanger ran out of water. Imagine being basically blind in space. Tethered to the station, Sergei had to play space guide and navigate his commander back to safety. Miraculously, they made it. But hold on, because the plot thickens. In August, just shy of the mission's end, Sergei found himself with a front row seat to history. Circling Earth on Mir, he had a breathtaking view. From the pyramids of Giza to the Great Barrier Reef to the Grand Canyon, all in just an hour and a half. What he missed, though, were the tanks rolling through Moscow's Red Square, signaling the collapse of the nation he called home. At the helm of the Soviet Union was President Mikhail Gorbachev, who had irked the hardline communists with his reform program, Perestroika, aiming to revamp the political and economic systems. August 19, 1991 marked a tipping point as a coup unfolded, attempting to oust Gorbachev from power. Though the coup fizzled out after a couple of days, the impact lingered and it was clear the Soviet Union's days were numbered. Caught in the crossfire, Sergei grappled with the chaos back on Earth. News from the USSR was as murky as a black hole, 
and Sergei, understandably worried about his family and friends, relied on updates from his wife Yelena, who worked in mission control. In the swirl of confusion, Sergei connected with amateur radio operators via Mir's communication system, including Russian language graduate Margaret Iaquinto. She provided him with uncensored news about the political turmoil in the Soviet Union. As the ground beneath the USSR trembled with uncertainty, Sergei, like the rest of us, was left puzzled, wondering about the fate of the space program and his mission. Little did he know that he and Mir were about to be swept into the vortex of the USSR's downfall. In a saga that feels like a space-themed soap opera, Sergei, the last Soviet cosmonaut, found himself navigating a celestial maze as the Soviet Union crumbled like a cosmic game of Jenga. With each passing month, Soviet states declared their independence, and by December 1991, it was a geopolitical free-for-all. Kazakhstan, striding fashionably into the Independence Party, claimed its sovereignty on December 16th. This newfound independence wasn't just about breaking free. It was a real estate grab in the final frontier. The Baikonur Cosmodrome, Sergei's portal to the stars, suddenly belonged to Kazakhstan, and they weren't dishing out any freebies. Russia, in its post-Soviet financial squeeze, needed a quick fix. To appease Kazakhstan, the Soviet space program agreed to give a spot on the next shuttle to Mir to a Kazakhstani cosmonaut. This posed a problem for Sergei because including Tokhtar Albakirov, the Kazakh cosmonaut, meant the planned flight engineer replacement, Alexander Kalari, was bumped. Without someone with the needed skills to replace Kaleri, Mission Control told Sergei he had to stay on Mir indefinitely. A new team of three cosmonauts led by Commander Alexander Volkov joined the Mir crew on October 4th. Just six days later, two cosmonauts along with Anatoly returned to Earth and Alexander Volkov took over as the new commander. Fast forward to December 26, 1991, and the Soviet Union completed its cosmic implosion into 15 different republics with Gorbachev bowing out. The international union that had flung Sergei into space vanished into the void. With a now invalid Soviet passport, Sergei found himself a citizen of nowhere, drifting in space as an accidental astronaut. Christmas and New Year twinkled in the cosmos, and Sergei, with Commander Volkov as his orbit buddy, wondered if he'd ever set foot on solid ground again. Strapped for cash, the Russian space agency could barely afford to send supplies to Mir, let alone get a replacement for Sergei. Amid the uncertainty of his future, Sergei faced the harsh realities of long-term spaceflight. Closer to the sun, he waltzed with radiation, risking cataracts and cancer. And there was an escape hatch, a Soyuz capsule designed for emergencies. But here's the hitch. Sergei was the chief operator of Mir, the one steering the ship. If he jumped ship, the space station could be lost forever. It was a spaceman dilemma of epic proportions. Either stick to the mission or hitch a ride back home. Sergei, caught in the vastness of space and the complexities of geopolitics, could only wait, wish upon the passing stars and hope for a resolution. Despite the toll on his body and mind, Sergei's determination and commitment to his mission shone brighter than the cosmos itself. For almost three more months, he tirelessly worked to keep Mir orbiting Earth, a testament to his resilience. But Sergei's space odyssey was about to have a conclusion. In March 1992, Germany, in a political maneuver with Russia, paid $24 million for Klaus Dietrich Flade to join Mir, making him the first German astronaut in space. This financial boost allowed Russia to finally secure a replacement for Sergei who by this point had spent a total of 10 months orbiting Earth. With funds from Germany, Russia's space agency selected cosmonaut Alexander Kaleri to take Sergei's place. On March 17, 1992, the Soyuz 14 crew, including Alexander and Klaus, launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome toward Mir. A week later, Sergei, along with Klaus and Commander Volkov, made his descent back to Earth. On March 25, 1992, the Soyuz rocket touched down at Baikonur. As the doors opened, a pale Sergei, adorned in a spacesuit featuring the red Soviet flag and USSR in Russian letters, emerged. 
After 311 days in space, his legs supported by several men due to muscle atrophy, he breathed in the fresh atmospheric air, savoring his first moments back on Earth. Returning to a changed Russia, Sergei must have felt like an extraterrestrial, especially since his hometown had transformed its name from Leningrad to St. Petersburg during his time in space. Yet, the Earth and the validity of his Soviet passport weren't the only things that had changed. Amidst the more well-known physical side effects of space travel, Sergei could boast about one unique outcome, time travel. According to Einstein's theories of relativity, the speed and distance from a massive gravitational source like Earth can alter the perception of time. This might sound a bit far-fetched, but when applied to the first GPS satellites, featuring ultra-precise atomic clocks, they found that within minutes of activation, the satellite's internal clocks were running slightly faster than those on Earth. This unexpected result rendered the GPS readings inaccurate within hours, confirming Einstein's theories. But what exactly are those theories? Einstein's special relativity tells us that if something moves faster than something else, time slows down for the speedy thing. Then there's general relativity, which says time goes faster the farther you are from a heavy object like a planet. Now, you might think these two ideas cancel each other out, but around Earth, general relativity tends to win. So when Sergei Krikalev orbited Earth, time seemed to speed up for him. When he returned, he was technically 0.2 seconds ahead of Earth time. And those GPS satellites we rely on? They need adjustments for this time warp to give accurate directions. Being stuck in space makes you a bit of a time traveler, and GPS satellites are basically time-traveling navigators. And you thought an astronaut stranded in space was the weirdest thing you'd learn today. Welcome to the wild world of relativity. You might imagine that 311 days of time traveling in space would be more than enough for one lifetime, but Sergei wasn't done yet. He continued his celestial career as a cosmonaut and found himself back among the stars just under two years after returning home. In fact, Sergei became a part of four more missions between 1994 and 2005. His journey reached another milestone on November 2, 2000, when he joined the crew embarking on the first long-duration expedition to the International Space Station. Across his spacefaring career, Sergei accumulated an impressive 803 days, 9 hours, and 39 minutes in space over 17 years. In 2005, he concluded his spaceflight days as the commander for the 11th expedition to the International Space Station. Reflecting on his time in space, Sergei shared that everyone who experiences it gains a global perspective. The issues that revolve around differences between nations begin to seem absurd when you're up there. Realizing that, from space, we're all just tiny, relatively insignificant beings on our pale blue dot nestled among the stars. With the vast, expansive nature of the universe enough to make your head spin, there's only one thing for sure. Sergei's story is truly out of this world. If you've enjoyed this journey into the unknown, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Becker's Casual History. Join us as we continue uncovering the strange and fascinating tales of our world. And of course, leave a comment below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for watching.